All right, welcome to uh, speaking from user experience. Uh, today, we're going to talk about designing for accessibility. I'm joined with Steve Maxson and Darren Staten. And uh, today we're talking about accessibility and why it's important and how you do it. And Darren and Steve are going to, they are, they are two of our UX experts at Crosscom and they're gonna help us dive into this topic a little more. So let's, let's get right into it. Um, what does it mean to design for accessibility? Well, first, I think, thank you for that awesome introduction and for having us both here, uh, although we do work here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so designing for accessibility to me just means you're considering uh, people with disabilities, right? Um, the overall goal for any product is to make it equally accessible and just give everybody an opportunity to use your product. So from a basic perspective, it's just making sure that everyone has the same opportunity to use it. Yeah, and, and I guess to add on to that too, it's like, it's to design, it's to make design or make your website, your app, whatever you're working on accessible to everyone, um, that everyone that encounters it, however they may encounter it. Um, and so when we, when we say like disabilities, that just, that doesn't mean necessarily like a permanent disability, um, like be, being blind, being deaf, uh, some of these things can be like temporary too. Um, and then also the another important uh, clarification too is on, on how they encounter it. So some of this also has to do with accessibility on various types of devices, uh, orientation of said device, um, th things of that nature. And I guess an another thing too that it often gets confused with is usability. And um, that's the most, the, the most closely uh, confused term, I suppose is um and the, the difference there is usability is how satisfying it is to interact with something whereas accessibility is just the ability to interact with it so therefore accessibility is part of usability but not the other way around it's the whole square or a, a rectangle or a square is a rectangle but a rectangle is not a square that type of situation got it Correct. Yeah, and I and I I like what you said, um, sort of differentiating the two, and also talking about it being temp. It can be potentially be temporary or a permanent um, situation. And one of the things that I came across that I thought was really interesting was this idea that um, people are not inherently disabled, right? Um, mm -hmm. Disability happens when they are unable to do to to interact with something that has been typically designed, right? So th they may have limitations, but they're not inherently disabled. And um, I think that's sort of what your y'all's answers um, sort of reflected there. But my question, my next question for you is, why is this even important? I mean, I'm, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but why is it important? And what do you lose by not designing for accessibility? Well, um, I think from a basic perspective, you, you lose customers, right? Um, is actually uh, a lot of statistics show like between 18 to 64 uh, is when most people develop or may develop a disability, right? So not, not everyone's born with a disability. Sometimes it comes later, like we all get older. Um, like I wear glasses, uh, Steve wears glasses, you know, and that's visual impairment. Uh, so there, there's a lot of ways that people can um, get disabilities and you're, you're losing customers, right? And one in four people, uh, adults, right, in the US, have a disability, right? So that's around 20% of adults in the US have a disability. And I think the last time I researched is 15% globally, right? So that's a lot of people that you're not uh, making your website accessible for. And um, I think a common mistake too is that when you are designing for accessibility, people believe it's only for those with disabilities, right? But you're also losing out those uh, on people that don't have a disability, right? It could be people who, this is not their first language, right? they have uh, um, issues with language. That's not really a disability, they're just learning a new language. So using your product may um, impair that ability for them to uh, use it, right? So there's, there's different things. You can have low bandwidth, images are not loading. It's important to have alt text, right? It makes it accessible. So people understand your website even if they don't have the greatest Wi-Fi or bandwidth. So there's a, there's a lot of things you could be losing, but it just results in customers. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, yeah, like what the what you're missing out on, I think, is is money. That that 15% of the population that that uh, Darren rep um, 
that called out. Um, it's been estimated that uh, translates to roughly $7 trillion a year worldwide. Um, and so like that is, uh, that's a fair bit of money um, if, you, if you think about it in, in that term and not, not necessarily the, the 15%. So uh, yeah, that's something you're definitely missing out on. And I, I think too, the other things that it, it kind of ties into are um, your, there's, there's a legal, ram, legal ramifications potentially. And I think that ties closely into your, your PR or your brand value. Um, but I think, I think it, can, it can swing both ways. Uh, I think we've seen this with like Microsoft. They've done a lot of work on accessibility, uh, specifically with their, their, their video game consoles. Um, I know they've released like a, a, a controller that is designed specifically for uh, disabled uh, people to be able to more easily interact with it when it doesn't have the, the, the shoulder buttons and things. So then that way, people with various sorts of uh, you know, physical disabilities are able to enjoy some of the content. Um, and that helped them out a lot. It, it served it, it, in, as far as like the PR value uh, of what that did for them. It was seen as a very positive thing. And, and then we've seen the, the opposite of that too, where companies do not adhere to some of the guidelines, specifically the ADA guidelines that uh, the US government in particular and other governments around the world, um, they look at uh, and, and have laws that revolve around those guidelines. And when you don't, when, when companies don't follow those and, and, and people take action, then that can really drag a brand's name through the mud. And uh, that, we, that it, but ultimately too, all of this just comes down to money. Like you, yeah. if you, if you, you, can, you can use it to, to uh, increase your, your brand value, which will lead to more money, or you can, all, you can also go the other way. Yeah, and I would like to add too that in between space between customers and money, right? Overall, like especially for a site, it increases your uh, user experience, right? So it's, it's proven that if you put accessibility first or at, and focus on that as part of your usability, the overall experience increases. Also, it helps with SEO, make your site SEO friendly, uh, which everyone is big on SEO, right? That's the buzzword, SEO, SEO, SEO. You want yourself to be searchable. Uh, so I think making things accessible increases that. Yeah, we've definitely seen that from Google in the past two years. They've actually made significant changes to their algorithm in as far as how they rank sites that if you are not, if your site is not accessible, you're starting to get dinged for that. And you might be on page one now, but if you don't follow some of these guidelines that they highlight in their various tools out there, uh, your site can really fall from grace in, in their in their their rankings and that will impact how much traffic you get which again comes down to money yeah welcome to page 99 yeah <laughs> so i mean you guys mentioned you know the business case you guys mentioned uh the law um you you mentioned you know increased you know seo and um overall usability which is part of the business case i'd say um and i think like part of the i think what we sort of know inherently but maybe a, a lot of people don't think about this is it's really just a in some cases just a basic human right right like to 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 and it's 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 the right thing to do and i think people sometimes forget about that piece of it um one of the the quotes that really struck me um i don't know if you all have read don't make me think um uh, the ux book but about accessibility this is uh steve krug he said how many opportunities do we have to dramatically improve people's lives just by doing our jobs a little better? And that to me, that, that really struck me as like, yeah, you're actually making a, a pretty significant impact by in some cases, small changes. Um, so why do you think, wh wh do you think this gets overlooked? And if so, why in businesses? Oh, oh yes, it, it, it greatly gets overlooked. Um, and I, I think it's from two sides. Um, from the business side, right, uh, is this notion or myth that is complicated. Um, it adds extra features, right? Adds more product time to your cycle, um, which is not true because if you're doing it from the beginning and you're really focused on user experience as part of it. So it shouldn't add, right? Especially if you're developing a product from scratch, uh, you're, you're not adding any feature. It is part of the feature. Um, so I think that uh, gets overlooked. And then from a design side, uh, especially a lot of young designers, right? They, they may believe it's boring, right? It's not, it's, 
it's not fun or or it hinders their aesthetics or uh, ability to design um, and make it unique, right? Um, which is not true. Um, if you, to me, to me, when you put accessibility first and do those things, you're actually creating a better product, right? Um, and it allows you to really uh, explore different avenues for doing that product. To me, it, it increases creativity, right? Because now you got to figure out a way, oh, there's some cool things I could do to make sure people who are hearing impaired can use this product or the vision impaired can use this product. Uh, so I think in those ways, those are things that mentally people have or little roadblocks that uh, hinders or is the reason things get overlooked. Yeah. And um, yeah, and in my experience and um, in talking to a lot of my friends, a lot of uh, a lot of businesses, especially like, you know, larger businesses with like very big teams, they're, they're most of the time in like software development, the focus is on pushing out feature after feature. And uh, it, it's not necessarily about the quality of those features. It's just getting new features out into the public's hands as quickly as possible. And that's where uh, I think a lot, of it, that's where like some of the accessibility things, some of the other like uh, uh, things that like, I think Darren and I value as UX designers, they, 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 they get passed over a lot of the times. And what gets put out, is uh, what is considered a, a MVP, uh, minimum viable product, um, is a lot of times what companies are focusing on. Um, that's considered what are the, it's a bare minimum number of features that we need to include in our product before we can launch it. And uh, so these products are launched bare bones essentially and stripped of a lot of uh, features that uh, you know, we think as UX designers, have a tremendous amount of value. Um, so I think that's part of a problem from the, the business perspective. I agree with, with Darren the, the, on the, the design side too, that a lot of, a lot of designers, and it, it, I think it's like, it's not just young designers. I think just a lot of designers, they, a lot of times they don't think about accessibility in, in, until like the end of, of their process. And oftentimes when we're working, um, especially like as I mentioned before with how businesses are focused on pushing feature after feature. We're working on design, usually when development has already begun on some portion of it. We're, we're usually working, if you're in like an agile environment, you're working ahead of them, but not too far ahead to the point where you're completely done most of the time. That's how it, op how it works. And if you don't think about accessibility until the very end of the project, it's already too late because the development has already begun and, uh, like I said before, most, most businesses are not willing to go back and, and spend more time on a feature because they need to get it out and push that, right. that, push that out to the public. Um, and the last thing I wanna to touch on, this is the part where I'm gonna go a little bit political here, but I think another reason why it's overlooked are the laws. Um, and, and this is this is like I think globally. I'm not going to single out the U.S., uh, but I am more familiar with U.S. law, being a U.S. citizen. But uh, with like a lot of laws surrounding accessibility, they like I mentioned before, they draw to they point to ADA compliance. But when companies are in violation of the laws, the ramifications for that are typically you have to comply within X number of days. So. Like, I, I think that is a, that, that's not really uh, doing anything to, to make it so that these businesses comply out of the, out of the gate, uh, because it's basically saying, okay, this is a warning, and now, now you actually have to do something. Whereas in, I know Norway, um, in some other countries uh, in, in, the, in the EU, they have more strict policies where right out of the gate, if you do not uh, have, if you release a product that is not accessible, then um, you get fined immediately. Wow. I think if we add laws more like that, then you're gonna see more companies comply and this become a bigger issue um, uh, for, for businesses and from the software development side. Um, and I, I, I think that's what, what needs to happen as opposed to just a warning, a slap on the wrist, and then now you have to do something before you suffer any like punitive damages. Yeah, and I agree with Steve. I think he hit it right on the nose. Uh, with that, you know, like just a slap on the wrist currently, but uh, even if they do have to go back, right, 
they still approach it the same way, right? They try to do the bare minimum, right? This is, so that's where you find apps that like, um, they'll take shortcuts to say, okay, we can do this and this will make it somewhat accessible. Um, and, and, and it's due to that, it's a fact that it's easier to include accessibility in the beginning versus go back. It's just more work. Yeah. So, so if, if there aren't as many motivations, I guess, that people um, on a daily basis have to do this right from the start, um, and, uh, and there's essentially just slaps on the wrist for, for not doing it, then, then it, it seems like the motivation needs to come from within the company, right? And, and mm -hmm. you, you all have the jobs, you all are the, the people who, um, your job is to advocate for the user. And, and arguably, we can, this could be another to um, topic where you know, every person working on a product should be an advocate of the user, but your job in particular is to advocate for the user. So how do you advocate if, if you feel like you know, there is something that we should be doing differently? for the user, I mean, this goes beyond just accessibility, but let's just, let's talk in the, about accessibility. How do you go about um, doing that? You guys are not the ultimate decision makers. What are some ways that you can influ influence leaders, project managers, whoever, or clients um, to help them understand? I think um, it begins with research, right? Uh, you can say things and you can do assumptions and things like that, uh, but, none of that really matters if you don't have anything to back it up right um most people they agree with facts and reason uh, and that's where research comes in right which is a big part of being a user experience designer or a researcher um you know taking the time to empathize and understand users you know actually meet with them you know what are their likes what are their dislikes what are their complaints how do they typically use your product you know how are they accessing your product um taking the time to like do personas understand them do interviews uh all that that is it's not pointless right there's a reason for all that right all that helps influence and gives you a guide or a picture to follow to say hey we are whenever we're designing or developing or doing something within our product we have this to look back at like these are our customers and this is how we can cater to them um so for me it, it's just purely begins with research yeah, I think for me, like my, uh, like a lot of times, like all, all I really need to do is point them to the ADA or WCAG <laughs> guidelines um, and send them a link to the website, which are very, um, very text heavy, very, uh, very wordy uh, in content. And there, there is a lot there. And um, basically, so, you know, telling them like, these are the rules that you know the 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 internet internet basically operates by and if you don't we, we so we need to do this or we're in violation of said rules and now this kind of contradicts with what i said earlier about the, the laws and the government and everything but you have i i realized too though that most people don't know those laws right mm -hmm. and so i can point to that and be like if we don't do this we're in violation and there could be there could be consequences for this so let's do we need to do this now yeah. And usually that's enough to get the, to, to push the, whatever we're trying to, to do for accessibility wise. Uh, yeah. And just to give more context into the, uh, the um, web content accessibility guidelines, uh, it's like WCAG for short. You see that a lot uh, that uh, Steve has mentioned, right? It's the international standard, right? It means a group came together and said, hey, these is the standard across everywhere that people should do for accessibility. And it, it, it covers a lot, right? And there, there's a long list that you can go through, it's like top four priorities, but um, I paraphrase it into my own little thing so I can remember it, which is WCS, right? Uh, or M MCS, sorry, MCS. So M is like mobility, right? Um, does it help people who have mobility issues? Um, cognitive, right? Which is the C for me. Uh, does it help people who have learning disabilities or uh, um, learning problems, right? Um, and then S is sensory, you know, hearing and vision. So it, it encompasses all of those areas. Yeah, I, I like that, and that's a, a a great way of sort of distilling. Because like you, like like Steve said, there's a lot that you can dive into but at least if you're thinking in the right way you're you're starting the process um 
it, it, you know, you're starting the process um, on a, with a strong start. Um, but you did say something, Darren, you mentioned, you, you said empathy. And I want to talk about that. In a second, I want to talk about, you know, the act, some of the actual issues that you might come across on a website. But before we get into that, I want to talk about empathy, because you mentioned empathy. And, and I think it's a great, it's a great thing to aspire to. <laughs> But it's kind of this this cloud of like, what does that actually mean? Like, how do how do I practice empathy? So you, you talked about you know speaking to different user groups, um, hopefully diverse user groups. But how do you actually uh, practice empathy? Like in in speaking with those groups or in trying to learn about those groups. I think it's uh this may sound simple and cliche, but to is literally putting yourself in their shoes, right? And to do that, that means you have to get rid of your assumptions and your automatic beliefs, right? Because we all have our own assumptions, especially as designers, right? We've been doing this. We worked on multiple projects. We're like, oh, we, we know how to do this. We know what to expect, right? But you got to remember that each user is different. And I think one thing is important to learn, and it's something I learned as I've, I've gotten older and worked on more products as well, is that they change, right? The, the users you started with in the beginning, uh, are completely different, right? They've grown, they went through life changes and you're, you're a part of that, right? You're, you're a user to other products and you've changed and went through life changes. So what that means is you have to continuously go back. It's an iterative process. You have to continuously learn and do research and surveys and uh, polls to understand who you're designing for. Yeah, I, I think uh, Darren uh, nailed it and uh, go in a little more in detail. I think the most common uh, uh, abuse of like, uh, or the, I guess most common, where, where people fall off um, in when they're trying to think like the, the user they're trying to target is they fall victim to uh, uh, different, uh, uh, a cognitive bias. Um, and, and there's one in particular, there's, there's a, a lot of them that make it up, but there's one in particular called the, the false consensus effect, which is the, when you, uh, make the assumption that other people think like you do, um, mm -hmm. and and that that that's something that designers um, and, and developers, PMs, various people in software development, they fall Mar victim marketers. to. Marketers, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but it's like it, when you're working on a product um, for a long time, when, no matter what you're relate, like if you're if you're close to that product. Um, you start to you start to learn more about it, and you start to make then assumptions that your users are going to have some of this knowledge, and you you sometimes forget that they 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 don't, and you might be using um, like terminology in 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 your your word the words on your website or or your app that doesn't mean anything to the user because you haven't defined it yet to them. And, and so, like, I think that's the, that's the thing that I think the most people struggle with. And I, I think, like, so as far as, like, learning to be empathetic is, like, I, I really think that there is, um, there is value in, in learning about uh, cognitive uh, biases and, uh, you know, just, like, understanding, like, how you can fall victim to those. Uh, and, and I think if you, just being knowledgeable of them you can catch yourself at times, um, you know, uh, where, where you're falling into that trap and, and it's making you make assumptions that may not necessarily be true. And, and, you know, even if you're doing user research, there are cognitive biases that if you already go into, like if you have a hypothesis going into um, your user research, which you typically do when you're doing it uh, the, you know, the, the, by the book, Sometimes you can still fall victim to cognitive biases because you want to, you might only hear things that match up to your hypothesis. So you really need to remove yourself and move any preconceived notions that you have going into something and purely look at the data. It, it's, it's easier said than done, but uh, that is, that's something that I think everyone should, should be aware of. Yeah, you said something, um, well, both of you all, I mean, to distill it down, it seems like on one hand, there's just incredible curiosity, right? For, for other people and, 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 you know, asking questions and, and observing and that kind of thing. And then on the other end, it's checking yourself, right? Checking your biases, checking you the judgments that you make. Um, and um, 
and 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 one another thing that you had had mentioned um you talked about the 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 when in getting those biases some of the words that you may use and that's an interesting thing when we talk about accessibility because like darren was saying um stating earlier it's not just it's not accessibility isn't just you know if i'm i'm hard of hearing or i you know i i i i, I don't have great vision it can be cultural it can be um societal it, uh, um you know it can be my understanding of certain words it could be education level um and so i think that's a, a an interesting way of putting it so let's let's switch gears though when we talk about when we talk about websites and apps and software what are some of the common sort of accessibility issues that we come across and um and perhaps what are some of the ways that we can get around uh, get around those and, and make them um and, and and design for accessibility Ooh. um well the easiest one which i think is uh easier to approach in my uh, my opinion right is uh vision uh so uh in two areas right color blindness um checking contrast right uh, it's actually not as hard as people think, right? There, there are contrast checkers out there that help you check to see if your contrast, uh, which means is it is it easy to read when certain colors or uh, things are next to each other, right? Um, it's it's easy. It's not as hard to check that as people think. And then um, sizing, right? That that's part of vision as well. Um, is the spaces between your lines uh, uh, size appropriately? Like, uh, which I think the standard is one point five, right? Or uh, text. Um, is your text large enough to read? Um, people a long time ago, you know, 12 point font was the standard. Uh, but um, on the screen, that is actually pretty small. Um, and I personally don't go uh, smaller than 14. And sometimes there are cases to do 12. Um, but that's part of like adapting, right? And just because 14 may be the standard for normal vision, right? Uh, if you have older people, right, you might want to bump that up to 18 or 20. So uh, just figuring out to, a way to adapt those. So I would say uh, uh, color blindness, vision, and things like that are kind of the easiest to go through. Um, I will also say captioning, you know, uh, adding alt text. Uh, people, for some reason, always forget that alt text is like a second thought or, oh, do I really need this? But it's important. And it's, it's not just for people who are hard of hearing, right? If uh, your screen is not loading, on your phone or something when you're scrolling through that's what the alt text is for and it'll let you know what that photo or what was supposed to be there so um i think like we said accessibility is for everyone and it impacts everyone so i would say those are three easy ones off the gate uh that's simple to solve but um i won't take them all i'm gonna let steve say a few as well <laughs> yeah well I, yeah i think that yeah the the two you hit one of the two big ones for me that was that was contrast uh, the other one that I think is a big one that I think almost everyone can relate to um, are, are hit areas. Like uh, how many how many times ha have you tried to, have you used like a mobile app in particular, something on your phone, right? And you tried to hit a button or, or, or close, a, close a modal window or something like that, and it didn't work. <laughs> like the, the hit, you find out that the hit area is is so small you have to get your finger in just the right area um like that that's a big thing uh with accessibility um uh, and then like th those are those are two big ones i think that are like kind of the most frustrating that um for for a lot of people because you see contrast violations all the time over the web usually you see that in like header header images where uh or header header sections right where you have text over an image uh, and then it will be like white text and then the, the image will have like white white or really light colors in it and you can't it's hard to read and it's really annoying especially when you think of like you have to you have to make things responsive right that's part of accessibility mm -hmm. and so like where that text lives on the image is going to vary if you're looking at it on a phone in portrait orientation where it's you know taller than it is wide versus on a desktop where it's wider than it is tall and so that's where you have to really think and make sure you plan these things out um, in the design process. And then, no, agree. okay, and then, it, so I think those are the two most annoying ones. Some of the ones that I think that are uh, the most often missed though, are uh, keyboard, keyboard accessible, being able to go through, a, 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 well, this is specifically to websites, obviously, but being able to navigate a website completely by keyboard. 
yeah. uh, because that is how some people uh, uh, need to interact uh, uh, due to various uh, disabilities that they might have. And uh, another one are uh, video or audio transcripts. This is one that I see violated all the time. Um, but, yeah, uh, and it's, it's written in some of the guidelines that are out there. Um, but you, like every video should have a, uh, a transcript associated with it. Um, mm -hmm. So basically then you can play the video and then those that with like um, hearing disabilities, uh, they're able to still follow along, see the visuals and, but then like they have the context of like things that are being said. And that has become more important recently because I know YouTube has made changes in, uh, they, they used to before when you uploaded videos, they would automatically uh, provide the, the closed caption and, su and support to it. And they've since in the past couple of years, they've pulled back on that. And um, so it's, be it's becoming more important now. And in, in a lot of other way ways though, accessibility features, uh, things like the, the browsers and stuff are starting to, to do a lot of that for us. Because before like things like font size used to be a bigger issue because you wouldn't be able to adjust the font size on a website. Uh, but now browsers, a lot of have, have that inherently built in, in a lot of ways. There's still ways you can, you can botch that, but um, browsers have helped in a lot of ways. But then we see things like YouTube where they actually are going the opposite direction. Um, so it's just like being, being aware of where the technology is at. Um, I could go on. There's a bunch of other things, but I think like, I'm just trying to hit on like, what I think are the two most important things um, as far as like frustration from a user perspective and two of the most common violations that I see everywhere. Yeah, and I like to add two more things that are kind of hidden that uh, people forget about, but are equally important, right? And I think Steve's touched on one of them a little when he's talking about headers, but structuring your uh, website or app properly, right? Using your H1 tags as H1 tags and your H2 and H3 and structurally, and it's not just important um, from a reading standpoint, right? Uh, but accessibility standpoint for people who use screen readers, um, right? It has to read through the content. And if your tags are not uh, structured properly, it makes it difficult for someone to understand what's on your website, uh, which leads into SEO uh, friendliness too. So it, it, it hurts other things. Um, and I think that's uh, something that people tend to overlook. And then one more thing, monitoring the amount of dynamic content that you have on your website. So what that basically means is, right, every where it's new age, everyone wants to do these really cool things on a website, which is cool, and I think that's fine. Um, but some things, right, when a person, like a screen reader, goes through a website, it does it off what's loaded, right? It doesn't, um, but there's things that people have on websites that continuously change, and they have not tagged or let um, the system know that these are dynamic content, right? So just being aware of that and just adding tags. This is simply, uh, I think they call it RL tags and there's other ways to do it, which like Steve saying, the browser does a lot for you and things are getting smarter, but just keeping in mind uh, that you have to structure your website properly, I think is uh, give me that people forget about, but I think it's not negotiable when you're designing a website. That's, that's that's really good um, from both of you all. One of the ones that, that I came across was like, not just using color as the only way to show important information, for example, an error, right? Um, using icons or other, other ways of showing um, important information besides just color, because for people who can't see color, they're not gonna see that error. Um, well, this has been great, y'all. Um, could you all give, we, all, we have a couple minutes, could you all give some resources um, that you, you all may use um, um, to help you design for accessibility better and some, some resources that you fall back on from time to time? Um, the biggest one I think me and Steve both agree on is WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, just simply go into their site um, is a major resource. Uh, from there, for me, I actually have a, what I, I do is create like a um, bookmark uh, folder, and then I have all my UX resources uh, for that. So it's stuff from Medium, UX Planet. Don Norman is another one. Uh, he made the book Designing for Ordinary Things, I think, something like that. Might have butchered the title. But the point is, uh, he's helped coin a lot of the things in um, UX. So and he has a website with a lot of uh, useful information for forms and building tables, making sure tables are just tables. like. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, affect accessibility. Um, 
So I have a lot of those resources saved. The, the two tools in particular that I would call out are the WebAIM contrast checker. And Darren mentioned it earlier, but there are, there are lots of contrast checkers out there. I just use this one uh, because it's from a website that is focused on accessibility. Um, that's what WebAIM does and um, they do a good job with their tool. It's easy to use and it allows you to copy and paste uh, permalinks and send those to developers, PMs, whoever it, it might be that you need to send it to. So in that way, they're able to see what the problem is. Um, and then you can just tell them like, you know, the new color needs to be this in order to pass the WCAG guidelines uh, for contrast. Uh, and then the second one, is uh, it's a program called Color Oracle. And this works on Mac and PC. Um, and what it does is it simulates color blindness, um, various types of color blindness, because there's more than just one type. Um, and, and then, uh, Philippe, I know I, 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 got, I got to give you some flack in this, in this episode. <laughs> but I know you said before, like, that the, for people that can't see color, and I think, like, there are, that you can have, like be like complete color blindness where you can't see any color at all, but it represents a very small percentage of those just with color blindness, let right. alone of the general population. Yeah. Um, so, but like, but like it, it, a lot of it is like, it has to do with like the use of like uh, uh, re red and green in particular. Um, and, it, and it, again, it varies on the type of color blindness. So this, this tool, I'm not saying you need to use it for everything that you do, but it is a good idea to just like go through it and then kind of like experience what people with types of color blindness, what they see. And then that will, I, I think that will hopefully resonate with you and like stay in your mind. So that way you're, you're thinking about it more um, in the future. Because like, ideally you want these things to become kind of like habits um, mm -hmm. that you develop. Uh, because like this should be part of the software development process. It's designed for accessibility. It should not be considered some sort of add-on or anything like that. This should be done all the time. Yep. And, and uh, Steve uh, noted when you're talking about like trying it out, that's empathy like we talked about earlier, right? That's learning to empathize and by putting yourself in their shoes. So I, I like what Steve just said there. But go ahead, Steve. Yeah, and the, the last one I'm going to call it, I'm not going to call it anything in particular, because it really varies based upon your operating system and your browser. But just like the, the color oracle is for color blindness, uh, try, um, try out a screen reader. Um, uh, peop so then people that are, are you know, have, you know, you know not, not just color blindness, but suffer from some sort of visual impairment and they have to rely on screen readers, try, uh, try it out and then understand, like again, the, playing on the empathy again, but understand what users are going through, and it might it might help you uh, find some some errors on your on your site. Um, uh, but it, it, even if it doesn't, it's still going to give you an idea uh, of how a certain percent of the population it will be experiencing the content that you put out there. Yeah. Um, so first of all. Uh, Thank you for calling me out. <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm perfectly okay with being um, an example of of just not just not knowing certain things. And I certainly didn't know. I don't know really anything about colorblindness. And I think that's kind of the point, right? Is that there's so many there's so many things that we don't know about and we won't know about unless we have that empathy and we ask the questions and that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, the example that I I give is. I, I was taking some medication recently that that made my that made uh, me have like started giving me like blurry vision and made it hard for me to focus. And suddenly, like, I was like, oh, I, I start, I, as I was doing my job, I was like, oh, that 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 should be a different color. And that should be that should be bigger. And I do that anyways. But I think that I was so much more sensitive to it because I was going through the ex going through the experience. and that's just temporary. Right. So, um, so I, I appreciate that. And I, and I also like what you said, Steve, about, um, the screen readers. Um, actually one of the, uh, I, I think using a screen reader or observing other people, how other people, um, use screen readers, I think is really important. And actually the, the resource that I had, um, came from, came from the book, um, don't make me think by, by Steve Krug. And, um, 
it was, he mentioned guidelines for accessible and usable websites, um, observable users who work with screen readers. And that's like a, I think it's an article. I haven't looked at it, but it's a, I think it's a people who have done the research. If you don't, if you don't, if, if you can't yet do the research where you observe people with, with screen readers, it's a, um, it's the findings of people who, who um, particularly we're, we're looking at people who um, rely on, on screen readers and how they use them. Um, a lot of interesting insights that he mentioned came from that. So another, that's a good one. And, um, and I thank you all for the ones that you gave. And um, is, is, are there any last, you know, any last advice or thoughts um, that you want to give the listeners? I guess um, there, there, I did, I did want to say that like the, you know, when you're on the medication, having a hard time focus, focusing on things, it really explains a lot. Um, from what I've observed <laughs> over the, the past few weeks. So, so thank, thank you for the context there. That, that's helpful. Well, um, <laughs> but, uh, not no, how I was no, hoping I, to end this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I, like, it's like I said at the, the, the last thing I said, it's just like, I, I, this should be something that is uh, important to every software development process. Um, and, and, and then another thing too that we didn't really touch on much here, but um, I mentioned it at the very beginning is, is like, we talked a lot about like disabilities, right? You know, whether they be temporary or, or permanent, but also it, like accessibility has to do with how you view the content. And so that comes into like viewing it on, on mobile devices. I mentioned before, making sure that your, your website is responsive. Uh, it works on, on a very, various types of devices. It should not, if you're developing software um, or website, anything, and it, it, you're only designing it with one device in mind, you 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 probably are making a mistake. I, I'm not going to say you're always making a mistake because there's usually exceptions to the rule, but um, you really need to put a lot of thought into if that is the right decision to do, um, because uh, yeah, that 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 plays into accessibility as well. Yeah, and. Um, I think, uh, like, the, not go off what Steve is saying, the other part, which we, we didn't really touch on as much, but uh, part of accessibility, right, or designing for accessibility also leads to designing for inclusion, right? So there's designing for diverse cultures, uh, languages, uh, mobile users, right, which predominantly a lot of people use mobile devices these days, kids, um, and people with uh, low resources or old technology, right? It all falls under that. And when you're designing for accessibility, you're, like a, I think the key thing to take away, no matter from all this, is that accessibility impacts everyone and benefits everyone. Um, I always think it's fun. People laugh at me, right? I like, uh, you know, like family members or uh, my fiance uh, gets annoyed by it. But I want those people who have the flashers on their phone. Because uh, like, I don't sense my, when my phone vibrates. I know everyone keeps their phone vibrate right, to be respectful uh, or not have their phone ring all the time during meetings. So I have my flash on, so like when something happens, you might get a seizure, like it, <laughs> it goes off really bright, but I notice it, right? I can see it flashing through my jeans or whatnot. So uh, I, I, that allows me to not miss messages and things like that. So, uh, so and I'm, I'm not uh, uh, hearing impaired, uh, but it still helps me do my every day-to-day tasks. So I just like people to remember like accessibility benefits everyone. Yeah, well, well, thank you, you all, for uh, really great insight um, about accessibility, UX in general, um, user experience in general, but certainly accessibility. Um, I, I look forward to more of these conversations with you. This has been Speaking from User Experience, and uh, we're signing off. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>